You know, I've been talking about Jesus and I talked about peace uh, for a number of weeks. And but the Lord gave me a message when I was in South Africa because I thought I was going to minister on peace there. And the Lord said, I want you to minister. I want you to minister this message. Uh, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deposit. It'll probably come out different than it did when I ministered in the South Africa because you're a whole different group of people. But yet I believe the word of God is going to come, 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 come alive in some things concerning your life and your calling. And so, so I'm speaking to the youth. I'm speaking to the adults. Because as Miss Carolyn said, we have to be ready, get ready, and stay ready. Because Jesus is coming soon. And as, as I was thinking about the message that she preached, I was reminded of a, of a parable that Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 19. And uh, it talked about how uh, it said there was a, the disciples were, were thinking, hey, is the kingdom of God going to come immediately? And they're thinking, you know, hey, the, the kingdom of God that Jesus has talked about, is it going to come like right now? But then Jesus tells a parable and he, and he tells them, he said, there is a nobleman that would come to receive a kingdom and then return. And then he says, as he, as he would return, he said he would give 10 minas, 10 is a money, is a term for money, to 10 different service. And he makes a statement, he goes, occupy until I come. Meaning that, that this nobleman that's coming from, from this, this business, so to speak, is going to come and going to give you these, the, this money and occupy till I come. The word occupy means to do business. It's, it's to do, he, so that word occupy, he's saying occupy, do business until I come. I believe that Jesus, he came and he deposited some things. And Jesus is coming back and Jesus is retur re returning, but he says, occupy till I come. The word occupy doesn't just mean take up space. So you and I as believers in the earth, we, we have to stop just taking up space. And we have to start doing business. So I'm doing, I'm doing business on behalf of some, someone else. I'm, I'm doing business on behalf of someone else on what he's deposited and what he's given me. The last time I ministered, I talked about blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. Yes. Some translations say sons of God. Say children of God. Children. Now, every time you hear the word children or you hear the word son today, I want you to change in your thinking. I want you to change that word to legacy. Legacy. Say the word legacy. legacy. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We need to understand something about legacy. And as I talk about children of God and I talk about sons of God... I'm referring to every age group. As I use the word generation, I'm referring to every age group that's listening to the sound of my voice in this message. Because oftentimes, as being young people in high school, you can think that you can think about ministry, you can think about legacy as something that you do way, it's way off in the future. Some of you here that may be a little more experienced in years than I am. You may think that, that oh, well, that's for, that's for younger people. No, you, you have a legacy. As long as you're living and breathing in the earth, you have a legacy. Come on. You, say, you may say, well, pastor, that legacy is for someone that's standing behind a, a pulpit that looks something like this or is called to a five-fold ministry. And, well, pastor, I'm just a, 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 a single mom or, or I'm just an at-home mom. No, it doesn't matter what your job, your occupation, where you come from, the age, your, your background. It doesn't, even, it doesn't even matter of what sin you might be caught up in right now. You need to know that you have a legacy. You have a legacy. We are a heritage of faith. And heritage of faith is all about a legacy. We need to embrace how important our lives are in the earth. You weren't created by accident. You were created with purpose. 
You were designed with purpose. You were designed and created to do something extraordinary beyond what you could, might, might be able to ask, think, dream, or imagine. Legacy. Say legacy with me. Legacy. In Hebrews chapter 11, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at the story of uh, Moses here. And we'll just get into this. So Hebrews eleven twenty three. 23, it says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Let me make this statement. They did not hide him because they were afraid. It tells us that. They said they didn't hide him because they were afraid of what the king decreed. We have to go back. What did the king decree? Every, every male child that would be born would, would be killed the moment that they were born. Why? Because the Pharaoh, the leader, was scared about the growth and the increase of the children of God. The enemy is scared of your legacy. They hid him not because they were afraid, they hid him for purpose. And since he was a beautiful child, they're like, wait a minute, we, we, this, this, this kid is too good looking. <laughs> That's not what it means. It means there was something in them, there was something in them by the Spirit of God, there was something on them that said, wait a minute, this, this child is set apart for a special purpose. This, this, this child has purpose. You have to go way back to Genesis chapter 15, and, and Genesis chapter 15 talks about a prophecy that, that the children of Israel will be in bondage for 400 years. And then it talks about then a deliverer would come. See, the enemy doesn't want you to step into your legacy because someone is called to be delivered through your life. And sometimes talking about being hidden isn't talking about being necessarily, we, we can put it this way. Luke chapter 1, 79 says this, it says, and the child grew and became strong as he was in the wilderness, as he was in the wilderness before his showing unto Israel. Meaning, meaning this child that would come would be in the wilderness and he was hidden in the wilderness for preparation. And so some of you may feel like you're, you're, you're not stepping into your call yet. You may feel like your ministry hasn't blossomed or you maybe haven't heard God's voice concerning things or you know there's something in you that God is calling you to do, but, but you're not sure how it's going to come to pass. You have to understand, don't be ashamed of times of hiding. Because it's in that hiding that preparation is taking place because there will be a time where you'll step into your purpose. So here, we always talk about the faith of Moses. What about the faith of the parents? Recognizing there was something that they were called to do, something that Moses was called to do. All because of a legacy that God has in mind. We could keep going there, but let's, let's look at verse 24. It says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, he refu refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So then it says this, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy ple passing pleasure of sin. Wow. So here, refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, remember I said son or children. Let's equate that to legacy. He was refusing. Another word for refusing is rejecting. Rejecting to be called the legacy of Pharaoh's daughter. Some of us in here, we need to, we need to reject the things that the world has called us. We need to reject the labels that the world has tried to place upon us. You need to reject the, the things that the enemy has tried to do to keep you small, to keep you insignificant. You have to re refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Because Egypt represents the world system. 
So you, you need to make a decision. This is, this is a choice you have to make. This is not a choice that God makes. This is a choice that you make, that each one of us make. The fact that I'm choosing, I'm choosing a different path. I'm choosing a greater path. I'm choosing a greater plan. Why? Because I'm choosing a greater purpose. So choosing, choosing, choosing a different way, choosing, choosing a greater path. Choosing to suffer with the children of Israel instead of passing pleasures for a season. See, your choosing is affecting your legacy. What legacy do you want to lead? Do you want to lead a legacy? You know, those labels people call you, oh, well, I'm just an alcoholic, or I'm just an abuser, or I'm just a failure, I'm just this, or I'm just that. When are you going to reject the labels that the world would place on you and start stepping into the legacy that God has called you to? And for all the young people, everything that you're surrounded by is going to try to fit you in a mold that is shaped with the world, whether it's music, whether it's entertainment, whatever it's be, it's going to be try to fit you into this mold that you weren't created to fit in. So you can make a choice now. You can make a choice at a super young age saying, wait a minute, I'm going to choose a different legacy. Moses had to choose a different legacy. I'm choosing, I'm refusing and rejecting to be labeled the legacy of Pharaoh's daughter. Amen. And I'm going to choose a different legacy. Yes, Lord. I had to choose a different legacy. I had to choose a different legacy. I remember, remember not, not wanting to do anything with God, having anything to do with God at all. Didn't care about God, didn't care about church, didn't care about the things of God, but yet at the same time, there was markers in my life that I knew God was trying to direct me. God was trying to speak to me. God was trying to, to uh, uh, shepherd me in a right place, but Justin was choosing to go ahead and just go with the pleasures of the world and go with where, what everyone else was like. Yeah. And I remember being 17 years of age and my mom invited me to a church service. told me to come to a church service. They went to a church that was about an hour away. And I was like, mom, because I, I, my excuse was, I got to work. I've got to work. I've got to work. That was my excuse. And so finally I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go. At least I'll go see my sister and I'll come to church. And I finally went to church and went to, it was a, a special speaker there. And, and he operated in, in like the gift of a prophet. And, uh, and, <laughs> and so there was some like, for me, in my mind, there was some crazy stuff going on. I'm like, we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, I was just like, it just, you know, click my heels. No place like home. No place like home. Because I, well, I was uncomfortable on the inside because, because I, was in, I was in a God environment. See, you'll get uncomfortable. See, if you're ungodly, you get uncomfortable in a godly environment. <laughs> Only me. Okay. Um, at the time. Not, not anymore. But. But so I, I remember in this service, and, and uh, the guy was ministering. He finished ministering. He started ministering to people. And that's when I was like, hey, you know, it's conveniently, young people, when they don't want to be in service, conveniently, they have to use the restroom, you know, <laughs> even adults, too. So, um, <laughs> hey, I'm not lying, okay? I, I, I know human nature, okay? And so, and so I remember being in that service and, and I was sitting about, um, I said four rows. I was sitting about where Mark and Cindy are and, and, and he was on the other side and I, I was about, uh, actually four where Courtney is sitting, I was four seats in and I had a buffer because my parents were next to me. So I thought, hey, maybe I can get move a little farther into the aisle and I'll be in a safe zone. And, and so all of a sudden he's going around and I just kept my head down, you know, cause that's the spiritual thing to do and just keep my eyes closed. And, and if I just close my eyes, this will be over quick, you know, and we can go home and I can go about my business. And, and so I remember, um, all of a sudden it was like people were ministered to and I'm going, Oh, and all of a sudden he came to this side of this side of the church and where I was closer to where I was. And I was like, please no, please no. And I'm just like, okay, it's like out of sight, out of mind. La, 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 la. And, 
And so all of a sudden I just kind of like just, okay, I'm just, this is gonna be over soon. And all of a sudden I'm sitting where Courtney is and everyone's standing up and, and, um, and so all of a sudden I'm like, I'm, I'm standing where she is and, I'm, got my, and all of a sudden I open my eyes and he is like right here. <laughs> He's like right here. And homeboy read my mail. I'm telling you, he, he knew things about me that no one else knew. He knew things I had done. He knew my thought processes. He knew how I thought about myself. He knew everything about me. And as, after he shared some things, and, and I, here I am crying and going, why? And I'm thinking, why am I crying right now? I look stupid. This is crazy. And then he grabbed me by the neck. I won't grab your wife by the neck, but... And so he holds me by the neck and he goes, beware of the calling of God to come clear. He goes, from this day forward, you're a marked man. And he said, what, and then he sang the old song, what a difference you'll make in their lives. And, and it was something that marked my life. It was something that marked my life. Now you would think You would think at that time I would be smart enough that God was trying to speak to me for me to choose a different legacy, but it still took two more years. Because you can have an encounter with God, but until you choose a different legacy. And when I didn't choose and and I didn't make adjustments in my life, it affected my health, it affected my relationships, it affected my confidence. It affected every area of my life until I started, until I got in line with God's plan for my life. You have to choose a different legacy. I can't believe it took me two more years. I had two more years of stupidity (laughs) for me trying to do it my way. And I know I'm not the only person I know some of you are in that, in that place right now. I know even young people can listen to me and even sitting there and, 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 and think that this doesn't really have to do with me because, you know, church and, and it's like another compartment in your existence. You have your church compartment and then you have your addiction to Netflix compartment and your social media compartment, your lust department, your anger department, and you look at church and you look at Christian living as just another compartment in your life instead of living out of life in God. Thank you, Father. Choosing, choosing. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy passing pleasures of sin. Now, when we think of that suffering affliction, I don't like the sound of that. No one wants to suffer affliction. And as the believer, we need to look at everything through the blood of Jesus and what happened at the cross. The Bible tells us about Jesus and said that Jesus learned obedience to the things that he suffered. And so we could, we could, we could, we could get real religious and say, oh, that, all those things that happened to Jesus and that the suffering that he did. And yes, he did a great suffering on the cross for you and me, so don't get me wrong. But you have to understand the suffering of Jesus was about obedience. Yes, yes, yes. It's about obedience. That, that's for, for us, the affliction that we experience now under the new covenant is being obedient to the things of God. Amen. <laughs> I don't like the sound of affliction. I don't like the sound of that. But you know what? When, when, when God tells you to do, th- want, do something and, and you don't want to do it, man, it afflicts you on the inside. It's like, God, I don't want, I don't want to pray for that person. God, I don't want to, I don't want to go ask for forgiveness. I don't, I don't, well, I could keep going that rabbit trail, but, but you have to understand about legacy. You were made for so much more. 
Let's go to Psalms 102. Psalms 102. Are you tracking with me this morning? You, you with me? Legacy. Say legacy. legacy. Verse 12. It says, but you, O Lord, shall endure forever in the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion. Man, I'm grateful for his mercy. For the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. Hallelujah, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. So what does that really mean? It's, it, it's kind of, it doesn't make sense there. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor in her dust. Meaning, meaning the servants are looking at the structure of something. They're looking at the stones of what was. They're looking at how the temple was destroyed. They're looking at how, how the enemy came in and took over Jerusalem and how the, how the, how the walls were broken down and they're, they're, there's favor in the dust. So they were championing what God did yesterday. They were championing what God did in the past. Then the next verse says this, so the nation shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory for the Lord shall build up Zion. Meaning, meaning there's something that God did in the past and there were stones that are there laying and there's dust that was there because of the, the destruction. But understand, God wants to build up Zion. God wants to build up something. God wants to resurrect something. God wants to establish something. For the Lord will build up Zion and he shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. This, now get this, this will be written for the generation to come. That the people yet to be created shall praise the Lord. So he's not referring to that. He's talking about a generation that shall, shall come. He's looking to us. He's looking to this generation. He's looking to you and me. He's looking to this legacy. That there's a generation that's coming that is yet to praise the Lord. And it's not about the stones of the past. But God wants to build up Zion and there's a generation that's going to come and they're going to praise the Lord. Amen. Then if you go to the end of this chapter, if you go to verse um, uh, 26, it says, They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old, old like a garment, like a cloak, you'll change them. What does that mean? It means new creation. It means like a cloak, you'll change them and will be changed. Meaning something's going to take place where this people will change. Then it says this, verse 27, but you are the same, talking about God, and your years have no end. The children of your servants will continue. The legacy of your servants will continue and their descendants, their legacy will be established before you. Let's go to uh, Psalms 112. Psalms 112, verse one. It says, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Verse two says, his legacy, his descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation, the legacy of the upright will be blessed. The King James says, his seed, verse two says, his seed will be mighty on the earth. His legacy will be mighty on the earth. Now you may not realize it right now, but your legacy is mighty. You have to understand you are God's seed in the earth and you are mighty in the earth. Not about mighty in heaven, you're mighty in the earth. Let's go to Psalms 127. Psalms 127. Verse 11. Actually, not verse 11. Hold on. Psalms 127, verse 3. It was the wrong page. 127, verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Behold, legacy are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Look at verse four. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Like an arrow in the hand of a warrior. 
An arrow is an instrument, an instrument for battle. So this is the, these, this is the children, this is the heritage of the Lord. And it, and it likens to this, like an arrow in the hand of the warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Like an arrow in the hand of a warrior, so are the legacy of one's youth. Say, I am God's legacy. And you're an arrow. You're an instrument that God desires to use. Look to your neighbor and say, you're a good looking arrow. <laughs> and this arrow is in the hand of the Lord. And then it says this. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. What's a quiver? A quiver is like the bag, you know, that they would put the, the arrows in. Then it says, they shall. So this is talking about the children that are like arrows, and this is the, like the quiver that's full of them, and it says, they shall not be ashamed. They shall not be delayed. They shall not be disappointed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gates. Man, Vic, we, we, are, we are an arrow in the hand of God. And it tells us that we are to speak to our enemies in the gates. Yes, sir. What does that mean? The word speak there means to warn and threaten. So as someone that is a heritage of God, someone that has heritage, someone that has legacy, someone that's an arrow in the hand of the Lord was created for something, and it says that I will warn and threaten the enemy in the gate. See, you and I are meant to be spokesmen for God. So not only are we an arrow in the hand of God, but also we speak to the enemy. We're not friends with the enemy. We don't try to get to know the enemy. We warn and we threaten the enemy at the gate. What does this mean? It means we warn and threaten and we tell the enemy to get out of my city. As men and women of God, we are legacy and we are to warn and threaten the enemy saying, get out of my house, get out of my family, get off my children, get off my husband. See, this is what the, this is what the, the heritage of the Lord does. Let's go to Psalms 129. So the enemy, say this, the enemy enemy. cannot have my legacy. legacy. Say the enemy enemy cannot have my child's legacy. The enemy, say it, cannot have my husband's legacy. legacy. To the enemy, enemy. you cannot have my wife's legacy. Psalms 129, verse 1. It says, Many a time have, many a time they have afflicted me from my youth. One translation says, Many time the enemy has afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth. Then it says this, Yet they've not prevailed against me. Just, just, look, just look back at your life, and even young people, look at your life. How has the enemy tried to afflict you? The word afflict means to narrow. It means to harass. It means to bind. It means to besiege. It says, many a time has, has the enemy tried to afflict Israel. Let Israel now say. Israel is really a representation of the children of God. Then it says that again, many a time has the enemy tried to afflict me, harass me, bind me, hinder me. But then it says this, but he will not prevail against me. I prophesy that over you, that where the enemy has tried to narrow you, bind you, 
keep you back. I declare over you that the enemy will not prevail against your legacy and prevail over your legacy. Many a time has he afflicted me. And that could have come from abuse as a child. It could have come from different things that you experienced. It could have come from uh, uh, failed marriages. It could come from all sorts of things, how the enemy has tried to harass you. Why does the enemy want to keep you down? Because he's scared of your legacy. He's scared of your legacy. He's scared of you recognizing your identity. The enemy would love for you to stay in insecurity. The enemy would love for you to to be pressured by by people and friends around you and love to keep you in a place of trying to please everyone. Why? Because the enemy knows as long as he's pressuring you, you will not step into your God-given legacy. 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 Hallelujah, is crying out in your life. Yes. Right. Today, for some, I'm reminding you of your legacy. For some, I'm stirring you to legacy. I believe God is marking some spirits in this place, some hearts in this place today. And recognize how important your legacy is. The enemy would love for you just to put up with stuff. Just put up with stuff. Just endure things. No, he's keeping you from legacy. You know how many times the enemy tried to hinder Jesus? Afflict Jesus? Tempt Jesus? Why? Because he was afraid of that one that was going to come and bruise his head. He was scared of legacy. If I could, get, if I could short circuit, circuit the son of God's legacy, then I win. And if the enemy can short circuit your legacy, he wins. If I could get just this, this one that's the son of God that God's, I heard from heaven that he's well pleased. I could get him and just bow down and worship me. Then I got his legacy. At the Garden of Gethsemane and the affliction that's coming, the pressure that's coming and trying to get him to give in and throw in the towel and, and just give up and just, just forfeit everything. Why? Because the enemy was out for God's legacy. Jesus was God's legacy. Moses was God's legacy. I mean, after all, Jesus, why did Jesus come? There's a number of scriptures that we could pull out, but 1 John 3, 8 says that Jesus came to do what? To destroy the works of the enemy. If we kept reading here in Psalms 129, the very last, uh, it says the enemy plows on our backs. The enemy pushes us down. The enemy plows over our backs and it said, but but he, but he, God has cut the cords of the wicked. God has already provided way of deliverance for you. But a lot of times we don't choose deliverance. We don't choose our own freedom. We're waiting for us to feel freedom. Instead of, instead of just walking in our freedom. Yes, yes. Thank you, Father. Go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Thank you, Father. Matthew 16, verse 13, this is familiar, we went to this a few weeks ago. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples saying, who do men say that I, the legacy of man am? Who do men say that I, the son, the legacy of man am? 
So they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah and one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the legacy of the living God. You're the legacy of the living God. See, a son, a daughter is legacy. Bryn, Corey, Ryan, and Andy, they're my legacy. Your legacy, your children are your legacy. And we can talk about the legacy that we have in the natural, but what I think we fully, what we need to more embrace is the legacy we have in the spirit. The legacy of who we are in God. You are the Christ, the legacy of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is who in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now we know that that the church wasn't to be built on Peter. That's not what Jesus is saying here. The church is to be built on Revelation. But what was the revelation? Jesus, the son of the living God. So what I want to deposit over these next, next, next 10 minutes before I close, what I want to deposit in us is an understanding that what will cause us to, call, to, to prevail over the enemy? What will cause the gates of hell not to prevail against the church? It's not just speaking that scripture to the enemy but is recognizing our legacy. Because it's understanding that Jesus is the son of the living God, that it's in that revelation that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against you. The gates of hell will not overcome you. All that the enemy's plan for you, he's trying to destroy your legacy. But when you recognize you are legacy, you and I are legacy. And it's more than just your parents' legacy. You and I in the earth are God's legacy. Romans chapter 9 tells us that you are, that we are children of the living God. So just as much as Jesus was a son of the living God, you and I need to brace the fact that each one of us are sons of the living God. And it's that revelation of our identity of legacy that will cause the gates of hell not to prevail against our lives. I know it might sound kind of, I'm not angry this morning. I, 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 this is just, this is so important on the inside of me, the fact that you've been beat up by the enemy for too long. And it's ultimately, and sometimes it's not answering another altar call for your freedom. It's you choosing your new legacy. Amen. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 24, 25, choosing, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing, the passing pleasures of sin. They're passing pleasures, meaning they're temporary. Then verse 26 says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. You could say he looked to the outcome. Esteeming. What does esteem mean? It means to value. It means to hold in high regard. So Moses, this man of faith, faith is is found in our choosing. It's not found just telling everyone you're a Christian. My faith is found in my choosing. And my faith is also found in what I'm esteeming. Because this, this is all recognition of, 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 of what faith is. So he was esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches, the, the, the rich, uh, great, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He esteeming, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater. Esteeming, valuing the reproach of Christ greater. Now this word reproach 
it's kind of like a, a word, but it, it'd be better defined as this, cause. He esteemed, highly valued the cause of Christ, g- greater riches. Amen. The cause of Christ was greater riches. But how often do we hold things in the world as greater than the cause of Christ? So faith esteems the cause of Christ greater riches than the treasures of the world. And we pursue the treasures of the world. We pursue what the world can produce, what the world can give, the high it can give, the joy it can bring, the lust it can give, the the pleasure it brings instead of the cause of Christ. I tell you, you've never stepped into true freedom until you've stepped into what the cause of Christ is. I remember, I remember doing so many things in the natural where I tried to find pleasure and joy and freedom. But there's nothing like meeting a need through the, by being an extension of God. There is no greater, I tell you, there's no greater high than being obedient to God and, and watching God touch someone else's life. There's, I'm telling you, there's no other high like it when you were used by God and God spoke to you to go to speak to someone and you hit it, you hit the nail on the head and all of a sudden they're like, I needed that. I'm telling you, there's no other greater freedom. There's no other greater freedom. There's no, there's no other greater high than being in the under the anointing of God and God using you. I'm telling you, I've been, I've been drunk in the natural and I've been drunk in the spirit and drunk in the spirit is far better. (laughs) Hallelujah. The cause of Christ is greater riches. The cause of Christ. The cause of Christ. I remember being down, they used, I think they used to call it Fire Station Park. It was projects just north of Fort Worth. I think it's shut down now. And I remember um, when I first came to Fort Worth, the Lord told me, I want you to go out and preach on the streets. And uh, I didn't want to talk to my neighbor, let alone preach on the streets. <laughs> Uh, to, uh, let me rewind a little bit. I remember we were going out to Street Witness, and I remember being at, um, everyone know where Four Day Weekend is, the improv place, downtown Fort Worth, Sundance Square. And I remember there's this, this little wood or little brick uh, thing that there's a tree in the center, and there's a brick thing there you can stand on. And I remember I was with a few other friends, and I, the Holy Spirit told me, he goes, Justin, I want you to stand up and preach. I say, What? And I remember standing, I remember going up on that, up on that, uh, that brick thing and I'm in fear and trembling and got up and just told my testimony about being healed. But you gotta understand, <laughs> no one, no one got, gave their heart to the Lord that day. Nothing, but I knew something happened. People stopped and they, they were curious about what was going on and we weren't condemning people to hell. We weren't that type of people that will go downtown in Fort Worth and do that, which is not the way to do it. And I remember preaching just the goodness of God. <clears throat> and so at first, nothing seemed to, nothing seemed to happen. And, I, and, and I'm standing there and I'm like, in the natural, I'm like, I'm looking like a fool. <laughs> in the natural. But at the same time, the Lord said, this was for you, not for them. He said, you needed to get over the fear of man. Because until you get over the fear of man, you'll never step into my cause. And I remember after I got down, and this is all happening internally on the inside of me, and I remember one young gentleman that, that, stayed, that were with his friends going to a bar stayed, stayed back at the corner, and when I, when I walked away around the corner, he came up to me because he didn't want to do anything in front of his friends. But yet, because of what I did, he encountered God. 
I remember being at the projects there at Fire Station Park, and I remember a guy, his name was Loomis, and I was down there, and, you know, we first pulled up there, and, and uh, three white guys, and <laughs> standing there on the corner, and officer pulls up. This is about, this is the sun's going down. The officer goes, um, are you guys lost? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, um, we were like, and the guy goes, you know, someone got shot there and killed last night, and, and so I just said to him, I said, well, we're just sharing the love of Jesus. And I was with another guy, he was a second year student, and I'm going, Eddie, what did you get us into? What, what are we doing? But I remember that night, that day, walking up down the streets, and, and I, there was a guy, he had a, he had a brown bag in his hand, and, and I remember coming up to him, and, and, and I, we were having a conversation. He goes, oh, I, I know all about that. I know all about that white Jesus. I know about, my, my, my grandmother make, made me go to church, and, and I said, but have you ever experienced Jesus? You might have heard about Jesus, but have you experienced Jesus? And, and he goes, what do you mean? I said, there's something that God can do right here on this street that, you, that will mark you for the rest of your life. And I remember uh, I, said, I said, can I pray for you? And he goes, he goes yeah, you can pray for me. And, and I put my hand on his shoulder. And all I said, I didn't yell, I didn't get loud. I said, I said Lord, Holy Spirit, Make yourself real to Loomis right now. That's all I prayed. All of a sudden, I look up, he's got tears going down his eyes. He started trembling. He opens his eye, he goes, what did you do to me? <laughs> he goes, what did, what did you do to me? What did, what did you do to me? I said, Loomis, I said, that was God loving on you. That was God loving on you. That was God showing you that he is real. So sometimes the cause of Christ will take you outside of your comfort zone. Sometimes the cause of Christ will, will cause you to go a different direction than the rest of your friends. Thank you, Father. He esteemed the cause of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. I'm telling you, when you pursue the cause of Christ, you'll never be disappointed. Amen. Thank you, Father. First John, you need to turn there. First John 3, I think first 1 and 2. It tells us, beloved, what love the Father has bestowed upon us that he would call us legacy. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called legacy of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Next verse, beloved now. Not in heaven, beloved now. We are the legacy of God. Can you put up Galatians 3.26? Galatians 3.26. For the sake of time, we'll just... It says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For you are all legacy of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. Thank you, Father. Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Keep going. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children... We were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. So now, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Many a time have you afflicted me from my youth. Why? Because he's out for legacy. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. Next verse. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his legacy. Born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as legacy. 
You see, when you look at the word sons or children and you see it as legacy, it's like now it puts a responsibility on me. Next verse. And because you are legacy, God has sent forth the spirit of his legacy into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Next verse. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a legacy. And if a legacy, then an heir of God through Christ. Let's close with this. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Let's look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are legacy of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which, which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are legacy of God. And if we're legacy, then we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now get this, the sufferings, you could say the afflictions of this present time, this natural world, what the world brings, the attacks that come from the world, the temptations that come from the world, the sufferings of this present time cannot be compared to the glory. See, when you see the glory of God greater than the riches of this world, you see the glory of God as greater, and you see that that's which is eternal and the things of this world aren't, it will cause you to embrace the legacy you were created for. <clears throat> the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. <clears throat> Hallelujah. With the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 19. <clears throat> For the earnest expectation of the creature, creation, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Wow. Creation is eagerly waiting for you and I to step into legacy. The creation is groaning. The earth is groaning. The sin that's happening in the world the confusion that's in the world, they don't realize it yet, but they're earnestly awaiting the manifestation, the revealing of the sons of God. Let me make the statement. Just as much as Jesus is the son of God, you and I are sons of God. Just as much as Jesus had a legacy, you and I carry the same legacy. And the world is waiting for you and I to step into our legacy. And it's more than just saying, I'm a Christian, I go to church on Sunday. Your legacy, you have an assignment. You have a people to reach. You have people to touch. You have lives to change. We have a city to reach. Heard your faith we are called to reach this city. But you need to see you have legacy in you. You have legacy in you. Stand to your feet.